you'd wake up to them kicking you when you're in your sleeping bag, telling you, get a job, you junkie scumbag, or well, a few people, a few narky girls that are going to be falling out of nightclubs at 2 o'clock in the morning. Every night, hundreds of people are sleeping rough in the streets of the city's capital. Many of these have fallen victim to addiction. They sleep in fear of what they might wake up to, or rather, what they might not wake up to. We headed to Merchant's Key, Ireland, to speak to one of these such victims, to see how he copes with the struggles of everyday life. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Gavin Hanlon. Um, I grew up in the local area here known as the Liberties, um, born, bred and uh, buttered. Um, I got a chance to uh, travel when I was 19. Um, I guess I moved away from the family home. I um, was allowed to travel to uh, places like India, Holland, Bulgaria uh, on a number of occasions. And uh, now I find myself back in the family home after being away for uh, 17 years. Um, and that's it really. When did you decide to come to Merchant Ski? Uh, over two years ago. Yeah. Started working here. Started off as a volunteer. And what made you decide to choose Merchant Ski? Um, because of its reputation. Yeah. Around town, around the city, around dealing with drug addicts and people yeah. with drug problems. And what, what would your job involve on a daily basis? As a project worker, I work both here and in the needle exchange, um, basically dealing with clients' issues, whatever issues they present with, yeah. whether it's from homelessness to getting referrals done or whatever it may be. And what do you think your most your most important job involved would be? Um, just linking in with them, just sitting and talking with them and finding out where they're at and what they need to, yeah. what they want to. And uh, the message book is a huge part in the running of the centre. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? The message book is where we put in messages from clients, um, work that needs to be done for them, things they would like done. Maybe family members may try to get in contact with them. They may believe that the clients use the service here. So we'll put a message in for them to ring if they so wish that they can get in contact with those people later on if they need to, if they want to. It's up to themselves. Okay. Um, so we run the women's group here in Merchants Key on a Friday morning. Um, it runs from 10, usually up until about half 12. Um, basically, anybody that comes through the door, any women that want their nails done, um, we, I do it for them. We have a lot of interest in the women's group. Usually on a Friday morning you could get anything up to about probably two till about six people coming in to get their nails done. So it's great for the girls to come in and get something done that they don't necessarily sometimes get on the outside. Living on the streets is very um, precarious. Um, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a safe um, and comfortable sleep, um, secure security is a is a big issue when you're living on the streets. Um, I've always said there's uh, two types of people that are on the streets: uh, those that are hurt and those that get hurt. And uh, you usually fall into the one or two of those uh, brackets and categories. You know, um, I lived on the streets in Amsterdam for a year. I lived on the streets in Calcutta for four months. Um, being an addict, uh, me personally, uh, I've, I've been totally reckless. Uh, didn't really care where I ended up or what my position was, you know. Um, I think that's just uh, part and parcel of being, being an addict. Uh, as, lo as long as you have the money for the next hit, you don't really care where you end up or how much of a compromise you have to make upon yourself, you know. Me, I, I, I was awarded the claim when I was 18. I was awarded £28,000 back in 1990. The heroin had really grabbed the hold of the Dublin 8, the Liberties area. And uh, I'd had my fill of drinking and smoking cannabis again. I was uh, 14, 15. It was doing nothing for me. And I can remember calling to an older neighbour of mine, a guy that would have been about 23, 24. And I called up to him and I gave him £500. And I said to him, what's this heroin thing all about? And uh, that was it. My life just went that way, yeah, and here I am now, 20 odd years later, still, still in that world, you know, uh, having overdosed a few times, nearly lost my life. I was in a coma for 12 days uh, this time last year, nearly died, uh, nearly lost my leg on several occasions. Uh, 
buried a lot of friends along the way, but I think every addict thinks it won't happen to me. I, I'll be wise. I'll employ a different kind of intelligence. But that is the that is the uh, the madness of addiction. You think that it's happening to everyone else around you, but it won't happen to you. So, but unfortunately, it, it happens to everyone because uh, there's no success stories with addiction. It's all heartache. It's all heartache. These are our medical offices, and we have nurses in five days a week and doctors in two days a week. They do basic health care, all sorts of basic health care, but I would say the nurses primarily end up doing wound management for the bulk of our clients because living out on the street is very stressful and they get a lot of wounds from various accidents and various incidents on the streets and we spend a lot of time basically patching people back together again, trying to keep them healthy. Another really important part of it is treating their feet because if you, even if you live in a hostel, you have to be out all day long and these people will sometimes literally walk all day and their feet will be in bits. So that's a big part of the medical care here is keeping them just really basic things like keeping their feet healthy and, and making sure any wounds heal properly and trying to keep people as healthy as possible along with the needle exchange which is focused on keeping people healthy as well. One of MQI's main focuses is their needle exchange program. At the moment we're in one of the needle exchange centres. Um, as you can see in front of us we, there's a collection of needles ranging um, from the smaller sizes up to the larger. The different needles are used for different parts of the body. For example, the larger ones are used for injecting the groin, which is a practice that Merchant's Key tries to discourage. Um, as well as that, they provide the citric acid for mixing with the heroin, water for cleaner injections, and the alcohol, um, the alcohol swabs. Underneath here, we have the collection tubs for when the clients bring in their own needles, um, so they can be disposed of safely. And these tubs here are provided by Merchant's Key to the clients um, to take with them on the streets to dispose of their own needles safely. Another one of Merchant's Key Ireland's focuses include um, their pamphlets on safer injecting which are available to any of their clients and are also available on the website that it offers um, the different ways of injecting and the safer forms of doing so. I can remember when Merchant's Key Needle Exchange opened um, I would have been one of the first people to be registered. I think that's going back as far as 1993. Um, I could certainly tell you what it was like before ne Merchants Key Exchange opened. Um, there was always you always had to share your needles because uh, there was so little of them around. Um, every now and again, you'd have to traipse up to um, uh, a certain chemist up in Inchicore, and uh, you'd see her coming in and he. Um, He'd, he'd, uh, the chemist would deal with his respectable customers first of all and then he'd see you standing down the back um, and he'd, he'd, he'd call you up and he'd say now what can I do for you and uh, you, you'd hand them in two rusty uh, syringes and uh, all the man was interested in was taking the money off you as well and he'd, he'd hand you out three or four syringes you know and you'd see him then maybe two or three weeks later after the needles were well worn and well well used and, uh, um, yeah, um, my friends are uh, working, all workers, um, mainly middle class. Uh, they think I'm a bit of an enigma uh, myself. Uh, they do love me. Um, I've robbed them many times. Uh, nothing sacred when you're an addict. Um, I, uh, I robbed my own family. Um, I, like I said, I robbed my friends, but um, whenever they hear that I'm, I'm clean, or that I'm getting clean, they immediately want me back in their company. Um, they seem to think there's something worth, worth hanging in there for, that beneath it all, I'm a good guy, I've got something to contribute, and uh, you know, they, they, they haven't abandoned me yet. Although, uh, I, many of the time I've walked away from them, um, thinking that I wasn't good enough for I wasn't worthy or something like that, you know, but um, my own immediate family, uh, uh, my dad uh, passed away uh, nine months after my 23-year-old sister passed away, so I have uh, my mum, my two older brothers and my older sister, and they're, uh, they're wor they work, they're family people, full of responsibility, uh, so I guess uh, I'm the black sheep now, and I'm also the youngest by default. 
had they uh, start introducing needle exchanges much much earlier on. I know um, I know an awful lot of my friends that wouldn't have died of HIV. Um, my 22 year old sister was HIV positive as well. Unfortunately, I had to start breaking the law to feed my habit. And uh, I went to prison for the first time when I was 26. And going in those gates of Mount Joy, age 26, I was uh, full of all the myths and horror stories that uh, you hear about prison. You're dropping the soap in the shower and all them other stories. But um, once you go in, they give you a detox. You're clean then. It's up to you whether or not you stay clean in prison. Like they say, there's more drugs in prison than there are outside. But you can get into a hell of a lot of trouble in prison very quickly for uh, promising your life away for, for, for some drugs. If, if you're having a bad day or your girlfriend comes up on a visit and you, you get bad news from her, she's after finishing your relationship and you know, you're looking for her, but like I say, but uh, if you can't pay your bills, you'll end up with some severe scars on your face. And uh, I've, I've been to Mount Joy uh, 17 times now in the past uh, 12 years. And uh, thankfully I've no scars on my face. And, Another, uh, for me, another another kind of intelligence uh, kicks in when I go into prison. I do take my time in prison as a time to get well, get stronger, get better. It's just, unfortunately, if you, if you have no framework to come out to, no structure, you are going to fall back into your old ways, you know. I, I guess I'd be happy washing pots in a restaurant as long as I wasn't entertaining that madness anymore. And that's rule number one: is not to use. You know, you may, be, you, you know, um, externally it doesn't really matter what your position is in society, as long as you're, you're not serving that negativity because uh, it's soul destroying. It really is soul destroying. In Ireland, there are on average fourteen thousand five hundred heroin users. 12,000 of these live in Dublin. The average age of death for a homeless person is between 42 and 53. The majority of overdose victims die alone. It's certainly not going away, that's for sure.